Good morning to everyone and welcome to this webinar. My name is Jonathan Goldsmith and I'm Senior Project Counsel at the European Lawyers Foundation. Uh, this webinar is organised by the European Lawyers Foundation and the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, the CCBE, on the European Court of Human Rights, case law application at national level, how to enhance subsidiarity. We have a very full house of participants today, and I'll make a few announcements now while people are still entering the conference. Uh, so you will see that there is a chat function, as you will be very used to in Zoom webinars. Uh, please, would you use that just to say hello and tell us where you're from? We're very happy if you do that, uh, so we know who's with us today, so uh, so we you say hello to us. Please do not use the chat function for questions. Uh, we do encourage questions during this webinar, and I will be... Uh, uh, making sure that questions are put to the speakers towards the end of their sessions, at the end of each session. But if you have a question, please use the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen for putting the questions to speakers. Please, would you put them in English? We will try to answer all the questions if time allows it at the end of each session. Uh, please, as I say, do not put questions in the chat only in the question and answer box. This webinar is being recorded. It will be in English and no interpretation is provided. Uh, regarding uh, certificates, if you would like to have a certificate from your bar to recognize the fact that you have participated in continuing legal education. Uh, we ourselves at the European Lawyers Foundation do not issue certificates, but you can contact your own bar and ask whether the bar recognizes the training, in which case uh, the foundation can share with the bar the participant list in relation to that bar's lawyers and the bar can then issue you with a certificate. Finally, uh, most of the speakers today will be using slides. One will be showing uh, a, a platform uh, live, but the others will be using slides. The slides are full of very useful material and they will be put on the foundation website after uh, this video, after this webinar, a few days afterwards, uh, together with the video recording of this webinar. And it will also be put on social media. Uh, so that brings me to the end of my opening announcements. And so now it's my great pleasure to ask the chair of the board of directors of the European Lawyers Foundation and former vice president of the Paris Bar, Dominique Attias, if she'll please give us a few words of welcome. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I love your accent. <laughs> I love your accent. Uh, <laughs> good morning, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you to another very important webinar jointly organized by European Lawyers Foundation and the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, as Janan explained you. Today's seminar, which is the last one organized by both bodies this year, will deal with the European Court of Human Rights and its case law application at national level and how to enhance subsidiarity. I think that all of you lawyers and all of us lawyers from all Europe know about the importance of the European Court of Human Rights as a last resort to ensure the protection of human rights. This importance is now greater than ever as we face incredible challenges. For instance, the undermining of the rule of law in some European Union member states and the threats represented by the measures of some technology like artificial intelligence are part of an evolving world 
that require us as lawyers to be ready and well prepared to stand on the front line of defense of human rights. Today's webinar will be divided in two main parts. In the first two sessions, we will learn from our distinguished speakers that I thank very much about the European Court of Human Rights, including its competence, how it works, and what the principle of subsidiarity means, and the CCB Guide for Lawyers making an application to the ECHR HR will be presented. The second part of the webinar will focus on the principle of subsidiarity. And we will have presentation on the course knowledge sharing platform and how it can be used by lawyers to enhance the principle of subsidiarity. And we will also hear about the endorsement of the court's arguments by senior national courts. I will stop here to allow our excellent speakers to begin to give us all this information in detail. I wish you a very successful event. Thank you so much, Dominique. Thank you. And without further ado, we will begin on our session. So the first uh, speaker is Stefan von Rauma, uh, who's going to speak, who's going to give an introduction to the European Court of Human Rights and the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, so Stefan uh, is a, well, here we go. Um, I've got his CV here now. Uh, he's a very acknowledged specialist for application procedures at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and for constitutional complaints at the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the Federal Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe in Germany. He's vice president and member of the board of the Deutsche Anwaltsverein, which is the German Bar Association, and he represents it as a member of the German delegation at the CCBE, and he is chair of the Human Rights Committee of the CCBE. He's also chair of the Human Rights Committee of the German Bar Association and commissioner for, human, for European Affairs of its Human Rights Committee. Uh, Stefan, with that introduction, I hand over to you and I will now uh, put Stefan's slides on the screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dalton, and thank you, Dominic, for, for inviting us all here for this, I think, very important topic. And I'm very grateful also for all people that are joining us online here and that are interested in the European Court of Human Rights and the way it works. And if you're lawyers, I only can tell you, you should be interested in that. It is, and this is mainly because of the principle of subsidiarity. I will explain you very in short terms. So maybe you can uh, already, Jonathan, put up the first slide. Now it won't move, Stefan, wouldn't you believe it? Uh, right, so I am having a problem here. You carry on and I will see what's happened. Okay, so uh, I'll explain you though. First of all, we are talking about the European Court of Human Rights, which is placed in Strasbourg. And what does the court do? It only will accept any kind of application admissible after the full exhaustion of national remedies. So that's what you should do as lawyers before you have to. Uh, you have to do your lawyer's work first at your national courts. And so let me, they, uh, so then, oh, uh, the slide is there. I can see it. Uh, here you see uh, something that you will find on the website of European Court of Human Rights. Uh, uh, if you look left down in the edge, you will see the link. Yeah, so you will find it later, but you will also be able to get this material after the session here. So the European Court of Human Rights will accept individual ex applications and basic only if the national remedies were exhausted before, which is your job as a lawyer. I will explain later what that means in detail. But first, let me present you the court in Strasbourg and how it works and different bodies that do decisions. 
So you see on your left hand side, the single judge. So this is uh, the single judge is the one who has the most workload at the European Court of Human Rights because he will select the cases that are inadmissible and will do an inadmissible decision. That's the only thing he can do. He cannot do a judgment on the admissibility and merits, only can do inadmissibility decisions. What does that mean? You, you must there also realize that one reason of inadmissibility is uh, if an application is manifestly ill-founded. So the single judge not will only control if you met the deadline or you met the principle of subsidiarity or you met the form you need to meet, but he will also check if there could be a violation of the European Convention of Human Rights. And if he finds that there is obviously no uh, violation of the convention, then he will file his inadmissibility decision. The next body we have is a committee with three judges. They may make an invisibility decision, but they also uh, are allowed to make a judgment on the admissibility and merit. So you can be successful at the committee with your application. But the committee will always only deal with cases that we call weckle cases, well-established case law cases. So if you have a case where the facts simply meet a very well established case law of uh, the European Court of Human Rights. And it's so it's quite simple to solve the case with this well established case law, then the committee of three judges is allowed to file a decision also on the merits and you can be successful there or unsuccessful. And, and then there is no remedy. This is also important if the committee decided in favor of the applicant or in favor of the government, there won't be any possibility to run against this at any other body uh, of the court. And then uh, we have the chamber of seven judges. So they do the most important work on the uh, admissible cases uh, that are well merited. So this is the cham chamber of seven judges. They also have the right still to make an inadmissibility decision because if the case runs to the chamber, then also there begins uh, the exchange between the applicant and uh, the government. So the chamber will, as the committee also does, will check this material. And then maybe the federal, the government uh, also made some arguments on the admissibility. And then the chamber even may find that the uh, uh, application was inadmissible. Um, so, but if it finds that it's admissible, then he can, the court can do a judgment on the merits uh, and on the admissibility and the merits both at the same time. Normally, it's already mentioned here, you have the possibility of an admissibility decision. I had this once in my career, so it's only a decision on the admissibility as a first step, but normally the court doesn't do that. He normally checks uh, admissibility and merits together and finds one decision. So then there is another body, it's the Grand Chamber, uh, with 17 judges. And there are two ways to get to the Grand Chamber. One is that the chamber, you see this with the small dots and it's called relinquishment there. The chamber says, so this is not a case for us. This is a case for the Grand Chamber because it's a case of principal importance and of principal questions of interpretation of the European Convention of Human Rights. So you have, if you have such a case, the chamber may decide not to decide the case itself, but to put it to get it to the grand chamber with 70 judges. The other way is that the chamber decides. Uh, so either the applicant is successful or the government is successful. And then the other party may claim in a three month deadline to the grand chamber that this is a case of principal importance. And then it may be referred to the grand chamber. And there is a small uh, institution of five judges of these 70 judges who then will decide if the case has such principal importance on the interpretation of the convention and maybe puts up new questions to the case law of the court so that it will be accepted by the Grand Chamber. And that you already heard it, there's normally no oral hearings uh, in cases at the European Court of Human Rights, but in cases of the Grand Chamber, there may be an oral hearing. So, and then you see the last uh, thing is that uh, then if the decisions are made, then it's the, the job of the, the country, the government, who is member state of the European Convention of Human Rights, to execute that judgment. And if it fails in executing, 
it can, can, can come, the case can come to the Committee of Ministers. So, Jonathan, if you may put up the next slide. Jonathan, you can. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm, I was unmuting myself. Each time it seems to freeze, I will put up the next slide. In fact, what I'll do is go to the next, the slide after that, actually. Uh, yes, you can everyone. do that. Otherwise, I can see we're having a problem with the. Yes, yes. Thank you. Carry on, please. Yeah, fine. Okay. So now I get uh, to the way of the uh, uh, of an application uh, to the European Court of Human Rights, and you may be surprised, but the first and most important step of the way uh, an application can make to a court's decision is your work that you have to do. So this is the first slide once more, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, you have to... No, I know. Okay. I know. I'm trying to. Okay, fine. Oh, well, um, you carry on. You carry on. So, so. The, the, the first decisive phase is the proceedings at the national level, because without proceedings at the national, national level, there is no way in general to the European Court of Human Rights. This is the principle of subsidiarity. So let me tell you two things on that. One, one is my private experience with German lawyers that tend not to be very well educated in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and the European Convention. What they say normally, they you know, they do their cases at the national level in Germany in, in, in the following way. They say, I'm an expert in criminal law, I'm on family law. I know what how to plead at my national court. So I do that. And then if there is the end of the proceeding, if I, uh, I'm at the last instance, I have no clue how to get to the European Court of Human Rights. But this is not necessary because there are some experts like Stefan von Raumer or Piers Gardner. And I simply then finish my lawyer's work and, and refer the case to the specialist. And then he will file the application at the European Court of Human Rights. This is a very big, big mistake. Because in my practice here in my law office, I then get those, uh, those uh, requests to refer case to the with an application at the European Court of Human Rights. And what do I do? The first thing I do is I read the court decisions and I read what the lawyers have written in, in the way through their instances. And then already after doing this in a lot of cases, my only answer is this case will be inadmissible. I can't help anymore. And why is this? Because the principle of uh, subsidiarity is coming in two ways to us lawyers. So the one thing, ah, so you have that now the overview uh, of the life of an application with these three levels. And I'm on the first level now, on, I'm on the proceeding at the national level. Later we get to the proceedings before the European Court of Human Rights. And maybe then if we have some more time, we also get to the execution of judgments. So now, uh, now you can, Jonathan, already get to the next one because we're at the proceedings at national levels. Wonderful. So that's where I am actually now. So what does that mean, exhaustion of domestic courts? So pre what do, have, do you have to do in the proceedings of the national courts? One thing I want to remind you is that you have, even without the European Court of Human Rights, a very valuable instrument in the European Convention of Human Rights. Why is that? It's simply by the fact that the European Convention of Human Rights in all member states that ratified the convention which is actually 46 after Russia uh, left uh, the, the, Europe, the Council of Europe. So 46 member states. And all these 46 member states, the convention is on different levels, depending on the states, part of the national law. For example, in Germany, it's uh, on the level of a normal national, like our civil law, like our criminal code. It's on the same level as a, a, a normal law under the level of the constitution in our case. In other member states, it's on the level of the constitution. In some member states, it's even above the level of the constitution. But in any member states, the convention is part of the national law. So if you write a thesis to your national court, you would never forget a paragraph of the civil code or of the criminal code that is important for your client. But a lot of lawyers simply forget that there is also the European convention of human rights that is directly applicable in each and every of these national systems. So the first and most important thing you have to do, look in the European Convention of Human Rights, look at its, its articles, look at the website, you'll find wonderful material on specific fields of law with the most important decisions of European Court of Human Rights and family law and whatever, you find that easily on the website. 
and use this case law of the court at the national level. Why should you do that? One is that the national judges are bound to the convention in the interpretation of the European Court of Human Rights. And the other thing is that, you know, don't wait for having a successful application at the European Court of Human Rights because, you know, the statistics is so bad. So it's really hard to get a case accepted at the European Court of Human Rights. So why miss the chance to use the convention and the case law of the European Court, Court of Human Rights already on the national level? This is your job as lawyers. And for that reason, it's a really stupid mistake to think as a lawyer, you know what, I don't have, a, to have any idea uh, of, uh, of the case law of the court or the convention, because then you miss a chance uh, to, to, uh, to help your client in the situation he is in. And then also, why is it a stupid idea to do this even if the case later we get to the UP Court of Human Rights, because you're not successful uh, with your interpretation of the convention uh, in your lawyer's thesis at your national courts. Even then, it's a bad, bad mistake if you didn't argue with the convention and the case law of the court on the national level, because then your complaint, your, your, your request for an application will be maybe on my desk or on Pierre Scardes or, or, or on Achilles' desk. Um, and then all of us, we will check if you used the case law of the court if you use the convention in your lawyer's thesis on the national level. And if I have a wonderful argument in the case, and I know, oh, there's a lovely case law of the court, I can win that case on the court level. But I look at the papers and I read your papers at your national court, and I don't find this argument, the case is inadmissible. So it's your duty to prepare that, even if you want later go to an expert to, to, to make the application. So this is the exhaustion of the domestic remedies in a formal way and in a material way. The formal way is that you, you need to use any, any kind of um, remedy you have. For example, in Germany also, the application at the German constitutional court, which is only a constitutional court, is not an instance, but it's the highest German court. And it has the possibility to make a cassation of the court decisions before in Germany. So I have to use the application at the Constitutional Court. By the way, this is the reason because I was beginning with applications at the European Court of Human Rights. And then I had a lot of experiences with cases that somebody else filed the uh, application at the uh, Constitutional Court, but he didn't have a look in the convention at all. So if I what looked at the Constitutional complaint, I saw simply, oh, there is no case law of the court. Oh, there is no argument with the European Convention of Human Rights. And specifically, I don't find the argument I want to use at the court. And because I don't find it, the case is inadmissible. And so what I did is that I began to do also applications at the German Constitutional Court to be safe that if the German Constitutional Court wouldn't expect the, uh, accept the case later, I have the possibility to file an uh, admissible uh, uh, application at the European Court of Human Rights. So this is your job as a lawyer to do that on the national level. So have a look at the website of the court, have a look at the case law of the court to help your client also on the national level in the best interest of the clients to be successful at the national courts, or if not, then to be successful at the European Court of Human Rights. So Jonathan, then maybe we run further and we see if you are able to get the next slide. Uh, lovely, very good. So application to the court. So that's the next step. If all national remedies are exhausted and you really carefully used the case law because you listened to my wonderful speech today, you used the case law of the European Convention of Human Rights, you used the best arguments uh, in, uh, uh, on the violation of the convention, then you will file an application to the court. So pay attention then since 1st of January, this is a very formal thing to do. You have to use the application form you will find in any languages of any member states of uh, the Council of Europe on the website of the European Court of Human Rights. You have to have use this application form. Using this application form would be another speech. I could take one hour for that. So I just simply mentioned it very shortly. Look at the website of the European Court of Human Rights uh, at uh, applicants, and then you find materials for applicants. 
and then you will find the application form and you will also find a wonderful paper how to fill in the application form. It's very formal. One, one short thing should be mentioned. You have to put in personal data of the applicant. You have to put in his signature and your signature for the power of attorney. And you have to put in all the facts of the case and you only have three, three pages. Uh, in the application form to put in all the facts. This can be a challenge if you have a big criminal yours good that uh, took 10 years or something like that. You have to put all relevant facts in the three pages. And then you have another two pages where you can put in the violations of the convention. You should uh, mention any violation of the convention with any article that is violated and put in only two, two pages, explain why there was a violation. And then you have another page where you have by how you use the national remedies and that you exhausted the national remedies. This is the, the, the application form you, you need to fill in. And then you can add an extra paper of 20 pages. And in this 20 pages, you can further explain why there was a violation of the convention. Please don't do the mistake. If the three pages in the application form are too small for the facts, to try to put another part of the facts in the 20 pager, Annex, it's, you're not allowed to do so. You need to use the application form in the way that the lawyer finds all relevant facts and all relevant violations of the, uh, of the convention already in there. So then the, the, the application goes to the court. Um, you see here the four of the basic admissibility criteria, exhaustion of domestic rem remedies, principle of subsidiarity. I just explained this to you. Then you have the four month deadline for applying to the court, pay attention. It can run, run out on a Sunday because most uh, jurisdictions have a rule that if a deadline runs runs out on a Sunday, it's the Monday. It's not at the court. It can run out on a Sunday. Uh, and then you have the complaints that have to be based on the European Convention. So don't try to misuse the European Court of Human Rights as another national instance. They won't accept arguments uh, of violation of the national law. European Court of Human Rights in general only accepts uh, it, uh, the if you if you really can can uh, prove that there was a violation of the European Convention of Human Rights, which could be, for example, a misuse of the national law that then is running against the convention or a misinterpretation in a discriminatory way that runs against Article 14 or the 12th Protocol. Article 14 is the right of uh, freedom of uh, discrimination. So there can be a uh, uh, a play between the national jaw law violations and the convention, but still there has always to be a, a, a violation of the convention. And the applicant has to be, has to have suffered a significant disadvantage. So this is also one important admissibility criteria. Then the court in its registry will accept your case. The first thing they will do is they will look if you uh, were able to fill in the form sheets in the proper way. So if even mistakes in the form sheet can lead to an admissibility decision. There is no cross at the right state you apply against. There is uh, facts that are in the 20 pager and not in the application form. Stuff like that is also checked by the registry. And then the registry um, will uh, lead uh, the cases to the different bodies I explained before. There may be then an inadmissibility decision, for example, by the single judge or by the committee or even by the chamber. Um, but then if you have a good case, there would be the examination of admissibility and merits. As I told you, prefer normally in one step, the admissibility decision, an isolated one is rarely made. I had this one once, but it's long ago. Normally admissibility and merits are checked together then you will have a judgment finding a violation or a judgment finding no violation. And then it is the job of uh, the uh, national, national government to execute this decision. So because of this reason, we will then, uh, oh, we, before we, there's this giant grand chamber procedure, as you can see, requests could be dismissed. If you ask for the grand chamber, the request can be accepted by the Grand Chamber and then can be a final judgment without or without a violation. So the next slide, and Jonathan, you stop me here. If you, if there should be relevant questions, because I'm looking at my time and there's something like five minutes left. So if you yes. think we should switch to the questions, I would give this 30 seconds and then we switch to questions. 
Yeah, so uh, you can do that. Let me just remind people, we've had one question in. It's on substantive human rights law rather than the issues you've been raising, but I shall put it regardless, uh, Stefan. Um, but maybe if you spend 30 seconds, I remind people, please, to put questions to uh, to our speaker in the question and answer box, and then we will we will take the question. Well, if, there's only, if there's only one question, maybe I'd put it a bit more than 30 seconds, because one Fine. thing is very important. If it comes to the execution of judgment, this could be a bit misleading to see execution of judgment and to see that there's a committee of ministers. Because the very important thing is, it's the main responsibility of the government that is bound to the convention to make the execution of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. They are binding. They are binding in any of their aspects. So there can be, you see this a bit further down, a payment of the compensation under Article 41 of the Convention. That can be part of the decision of the European Court of Human if you ask for such compensation as a lawyer. There is a deadline and the court will inform you about that, how to, how to claim that, uh, that uh, uh, payment of compensation. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, there, the, the court will say that if there is a violation of the Convention, they will say this and that article is violated. And then the court may say you have the state has to adapt general measures. For example, there could be a law under uh, the state law that is uh, violating the convention. Then the court would say that uh, the, the, the country has to change, even if the court doesn't say it. Simply, if the court puts in the violation of the convention, the court has the obligation to change its national law or individual measures. For example, if somebody is in prison and it's a violation of the convention, then the court may even say, uh, release this guy from, from the prison. So these are the measures the court can take, and this is the obligation of the state. And only if the state fails to do so, then we have this execution of judgment scheme with the committee of ministers and with an examination of the case by the committee of ministers in a case of unsatisfied execution, it's going back to the examination. And then hopefully uh, there will be one time a satisfactory execution. And I know that Piers will present the CCBE guide. We are both yeah. authors in, and he will point out this this uh, aspect a little bit more. So maybe thank you, yes, Stefan. There are the now question. sorry to yeah. There are a couple Good. of questions. Fine. That's why I interrupt you. In fact, yes, three please. now. So let's okay. So Natalia Machina says it was mentioned that the principle of subsidiarity comes in three ways. Could you please clarify what are the ways? So uh, the, the principal thing is, I would say it's in two ways. The one is the material way and the formal way. The formal way says that you have to use any instance court you have and any constitutional court. So you exhaust the remedies by exhausting all national remedies you have. This is the formal way. And the material way is that you use the argument, I have to use later at the application at the European Court of Human Rights, or you, if you do it yourself, you use the same argument that you want to later use at the European Court of Human Rights level already on the national level to give your national judges the chance, you know, to help. You know, that's the idea. The national judges shall solve the problem with the use of the convention. So you as a lawyer present the argument already there, presenting the violation of the convention, using the article of the convention that is violated and using the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. I would say this is the two ways you have to use the principle of subsidiarity. Thank you. And that answers Amelia Diaz's question as well. Uh, Jacek Kowalewski says, how detailed should the use of ECHR case law be in our domestic pleading to avoid the inadmissibility decision by an ECHR body or panel? This is an excellent question. And it's it can differ. It can differ from country to country. For example, in Germany, we are very privileged because we have a constitution that is nearly completely the same than the European Convention of Human Rights. So in Germany, for example, the European Court of Human Rights will accept if I even don't mention the convention and its article and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Why? Because I have the same uh, right in my constitution, and I have the case law of the constitutional court. So uh, there could be a, a case admissible against Germany if I simply use the same right that I have in the convention, the parallel right in the constitution, and, and the case law of the convention, the parallel 
uh, of the European Court of Europe, the parallel case law of uh, the Constitutional Court. This is Germany. But for example, Piers Gardner, he will sit, tell something completely different because there's no constitution in, in Great Britain. He will explain that maybe. And, and so he has to really uh, use in Great Britain, he has really to use the European Convention of Human Rights and the case law. So in general, I would say it's very important to simply find the, the basic idea of the violation that you want to yeah, that you want to claim at the European Court of Human Rights. The basic idea, and then put the basic idea in and its argument. But it has to be the same idea. For example, if you ask for, uh, if you say there was a violation because of a discrimination on national law, and you say it was a discrimination because of the sex, because my client was a woman, and then later at the European Court of Human Rights, you want to use a discrimination because of the race, because your client is a, a a, a colored woman, and you didn't use that argument on the national law, this argument will be inadmissible by the court. Can we quickly ask one more question, because we're exactly on time, and that's the end, we'll move on. We did have another detailed question in writing, I'll take that later. Uh, uh, Shujana Pitonakova Pitana says, could you please explain what significant disadvantage means? Okay, this is quite tricky, because it's, it's, it's broad in some way, because uh, this is a new inadmissibility criteria. So it was newly in the, in the reform, in the ongoing reform of the European Court of Human Rights put in. When I was beginning my job, this <coughs> criteria didn't, didn't exist. So I think what the court wants to do is that there could be a violation, let's say, uh, leaves of the tree of your neighbor fall on your, uh, uh, on your garden, and you're very angry about that. And there may be a violation of your uh, right of property in Article 1 of Protocol 1, but it's simply a leaf of your neighbor's uh, tree on your uh, in your garden. So there is no really heavy burden on you. So the, the court wants to exclude such cases, but it's a very individual decision. But there can be also violations with a very minimum, for example, a violation with a, a small value of a property, uh, and there is a violation, but still the question is of principal importance because in the, in the national law, there's a principle, a structural problem with the convention, then the court can find, even if the damage is very small, that it's important. So it's very tricky to say, but it's, I think if you use your, your, your natural brain and you just simply think, is this very relevant to me? Is this a heavy violation uh, or no? You will find the solution on that question. Thank you, Stefan. We must move. Thank you very much indeed for your excellent presentation. We must move on to our next session. We're a couple of minutes behind. Uh, our next speaker will be Piers Gardner, who's been referred to already. Uh, he'll be speaking about the updated CCD guide for lawyers applying before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, Piers Gardner is a barrister uh, in England and Wales and also in Ireland, and he was a solicitor before that, and he was a member of the Secretariat of the the European Commission of Human Rights for a number of years. He practices European and international law with particular emphasis uh, on the European Convention on Human Rights. He's been involved in convention cases concerning 36 European countries, uh, apart from the UK. I'm not going to list them all because we don't have time. Uh, from Albania uh, to Ukraine under 12 presidents of the court. Uh, he's been a member of the CCBE's permanent representation to the European Court of Human Rights since 2014 and its chair since 2018. So Piers, please would you uh, begin? Uh, the slides are being done not by me but by Vasilis to make sure they don't freeze. So Vasilis, please put up Piers' slides. Thank you. Over to you, Piers. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to join this seminar and uh, even more pleased that there are so many participants who are interested in this important area of the operation of the European Convention, the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, and the question of what is this rather new concept of subsidiarity. And what I'd like to do uh, in the time allotted is first, I'm alerted by the questions that have already been raised to the way in which I can uh, mesh in what I'm going to say with what you've just heard already uh, from Stefan von Reumer. And I'm going to try and illustrate uh, what it really means to 
uh, in a practical way to exhaust domestic remedies in your domestic jurisdiction before applying to Strasbourg if you have to. And I'd like to take a step back before going any further and just recall that the European Convention of Human Rights isn't very new. It was drafted in 1949 and came into force just over 70 years ago. So most of the participants on this webinar were not thought of, if I may put it that way, at a time when the convention started up and the court started working. Initially, there were a few cases that went to Strasbourg, and the court really only got into its stride even a little bit in the 1970s and 1980s. But in those days, the number of cases that the court managed to deal with and indeed was asked to deal with in any given year were in the really low digits. We're talking 10, 20 cases until much later. And the big transformation was, of course, in following the changes in the convention brought about in the late 80s. And uh, in the 2000s, the number of applications shot up. And now we're dealing with a court which has been in existence for a long time and in consequence has done something which not every court would have done, but it has. It with now a million applications, or rather, I'm so sorry, it hasn't dealt with all of those, but it's had a million applications. There are a lot of them pending at the moment. About 70,000 cases are pending as of today. But it's had a million applications, and the key feature about the European Court of Human Rights is that it follows its own case law. And in consequence, you need to be familiar with that case law if you want to plead on the basis of the convention. And for many of you, the idea of relying on case law in order to establish the meaning of the convention may not be entirely familiar. And it certainly may not be the usual way in which your national courts deal with cases. Very often, of course, uh, case court practice is relevant to the interpretation of a code or other provision, but only in a few jurisdictions of which, obviously, the United Kingdom is a well-known example, Ireland's another, and there are many others, of course, where we actually operate a system of what is usually called precedent. In other words, the court has decided, and that principle, based on the facts of that previous case, gives guidance, authoritative guidance, to the interpretation of the relevant provision. Well, the European Court of Human Rights operates in a very similar way. So out of its established case law going back over decades, it has dealt with a very large number of cases. And one of the points I'm going to be underlining in the course of my remarks now is how difficult it is to meet the requirement that the court now expects that you should plead in your domestic jurisdiction when you are taking a case which ultimately you think might have to go to Strasbourg because of the difficulty of winning at home. But when you're taking such a case, Strasbourg expects you to plead not merely the convention, but its case law, as Stefan has explained. And the, the next general point to bear in mind is something that we should skate over very carefully, actually, and that is that the European Convention on Human Rights is part of the domestic law of all the member states of the Council of Europe, as Stefan mentioned, all 46 of them. Well, are you sure that you fully appreciate the way in which the convention is part of your domestic law? And is it really the practice of your pleading in cases and of other practitioners when litigating to plead the convention as a matter of course? As Stefan has mentioned, in the United Kingdom, where we don't have a written constitution, I think we may have a constitution, Stefan, but we don't have a written one, um, the European Convention of Human Rights has been enacted into national law as a means of interpreting legal rules of all kinds, statutes and otherwise. And therefore, the uh, convention has a very prominent place in the case law of the national courts. But that's not the same everywhere. And so we'll be dealing, uh, attending to that difficulty that you will face in making applications to Strasbourg and above all, 
in trying to get remedies at home. The court is also overburdened, and this has le led to its being much more keen on the concept of subsidiarity and on the principle that human rights protection needs to be in the domestic jurisdiction. But that isn't only because the court is overburdened. It's also because if the convention is part of the domestic law of all the member states, the Council of Europe, the court ought to be redundant. It ought to be possible to win in Strasbourg at uh, everybody, uh, at every eventual uh, opportunity in the national court. Well, perhaps we could go, please, to the first slide, and uh, I'll um, explain a little bit about the CCB's guide to the European Court of Human Rights, Questions and Answers for Lawyers. This is um, the, the um, a guide produced in English and French. I'm afraid those are the only two languages in which it's produced, but you have the link to it. And uh, it's now in its fifth iteration. We've just revised it up to date, and it was uh, published on the website uh, last Thursday. So you heard it here first. And the intention of the guide is to help practitioners who may or may not be familiar with the procedures of the court uh, to make their applications. And I'd like to give you just a few flavors of it. So if we could have the next slide, please. Um, I wanted to illustrate the way in which it explains different steps in the procedure which you've heard about from Stefan von Heume. So it sets out a question here at what stage during proceedings before national courts should human rights be uh, pleaded? And uh, based on the principle, as you see in the first paragraph, that the convention is part of the legal system of every member state, uh, the result is that in the uh, second paragraph, you'll see that it's member states who have the primary responsibility for protecting convention rights. So in a way, we should today be talking about the use of the convention in your national legal system, and there are many represented today, and I think and I hope that this may give rise to some questions, that it is in fact in your domestic courts that you need to use the convention in order to vindicate your client's rights. And the, the European Court of Human Rights, much as, of course, we admire it greatly and its achievements are astonishing, um, is a last resort and not a first resort, and indeed may not be a necessary resort at all. So if we could have the next slide, please. Um, as you've heard already uh, in, the, um, in Stefan's uh, comments, um, it is necessary to appeal to a, the final instance of your national legal system before you can have access to Strasbourg. Pause for a minute. How many of you have been involved in appeals to your highest courts, whether it's the Supreme Court or a constitutional court? These cases tend to be very rare. And so we should be expecting cases that go on to Strasbourg to be even rarer because after all, the national remedy should be provided by the national court. And one hopes it's not necessary to appeal at all that you can get a remedy under the convention principles from your first instance court, or at worst, on a first instance of appeal. Could we have the next slide, please? And we lead to a real practical difficulty, which Stefan's already touched on. And that is that the court's case law, which, as I've said, is very extensive, may give guidance which will help your client. And that's why you need to know about the convention case law as soon as you get involved in litigation involving a public authority. Can the convention help? And the convention being not merely the provisions of the convention, but as we've seen, the case law which has been developed by it. So the first guidance is know the convention case law and apply it in your national legal system. And you may not have to go to Strasbourg at all. Could we have the next slide, please? Not only 
you should rely on the court's case law in the pleadings to your national court, but you should also make clear what you think the consequences of the convention and its implications really are for your client. So in the final sentence of this uh, slide, you, it, the guide urges you to clearly state the remedy which you think flows from the fact that a convention principle has been breached. So don't just be satisfied with saying, oh dear, there's a human rights issue here. Tell your national court what the outcome is. So if we could have the next slide, please. And you'll see that this guide is really hammering home the place of the convention in the national legal system. The uh, rule that the court is increasingly illustrating, and I'm going to illustrate this with two cases in just a moment, the court is increasingly relying on the necessity to have pleaded before the national courts its own case law. And when that, you, you may think, well, that might not be too difficult. I might identify the name of a case that's been decided concerning my jurisdiction, which is somewhat similar. I'm sorry to say that that won't do. As we're going to see in a moment, the court regards the interpretation of the convention as one whole enterprise. So if it interprets a, the convention in relation to a case concerning France, and the facts and analysis are relevant to your case in Estonia or in Italy, then I'm sorry to have to say you need to know about that case against France. And you have to, and this is much more difficult, you have to persuade your national court that it should take account of the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, even if those cases do not relate to your home state, but have been taken in cases concerning other states, the Council of Europe. And from my own experience, and I'm sure it's yours as well, it's not easy to persuade a court in, shall we say, France, to accept that a judgment relating to uh, events in, shall we say, Latvia, um, are relevant and legally binding on the court's analysis in France. That's quite an uphill struggle, but that is what the court now expects us to be doing. Could we have the next slide, please? So I want now to turn to two cases which illustrate the way in which the requirement to exhaust domestic remedies operates. The two elements which Stefan uh, described, the formal and the substantive rule of exhaustion. So it is, as we you see here, Article 35 of the Convention, which requires the exhaustion of domestic remedies before the European Court can examine an application, is, does not only require appealing to the highest national court, but also demonstrably relying in that appeal that the, on the argument which will ultimately be made to the European Court and using the case law of the pleadings in the national courts. Now, I want to illustrate these two aspects of the way in which exhaustion works um, by reference to two cases. And one is a case uh, decided uh, judgment given last week I thought you'd like to be confident that you were getting the latest. And uh, this is a, a case con concerning Switzerland, which has just been determined by the Grand Chamber of the Court. So it is in many ways the most authoritative uh, expression of, and the most recent, in relation to the exhaustion of domestic remedies. Just to give you a little context, the complaint made by the Communauté Genevoise d'Action Syndicale, which is uh, an association based in Geneva. The complaint they made related to the restriction on public, uh, public um, demonstrations imposed as a result of the COVID epidemic. And uh, the restriction was uh, very substantial. Uh, it was effectively impossible to hold 
uh, marches uh, unless a special dispensation had been given. And the special dispensation procedure was rather complicated. And the association claimed that this was an interference with the uh, right to freedom of expression and a freedom of association, uh, Articles 10 and 11 of the Convention. And it was obviously a very sensitive case, as we've all known. There have been many restrictions in place during the COVID pandemic, and um, they have been very far-reaching. Uh, but on the other hand, the pandemic was extremely serious. So these are the sorts of um, issue where we needn't be worrying about this being a trivial case that would not really uh, clear the hurdles. So if we could have the next slide, please. Actually, can I interrupt you, Piers, yes. only because there's a question. I know you said you didn't mind being interrupted. There's a question on that very point of exhaustion of domestic remedies. So I thought mm -hmm. we may as well take the question whilst you're talking about it. Absolutely. It's from, it's from Zahari Iankov, who says, in the case of SF and others against Bulgaria, the court dismisses the government claim that exhaustion of domestic remedies rule is not met by examining whether such a claim would have been reasonably likely to succeed at the time when the applicants lodged their application. Could you elaborate on that? Now, I don't know. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if it means something to you, can you answer, please? I can. And it's a very good question. Thank you very much for it. Um, case law doesn't stand still. In any of our countries, the major leading judgments sometimes push the boundaries of previous interpretation. Sometimes the boundary goes backwards, sometimes it goes forwards. The way you look at it depends upon which side of that argument your client was on. And the issue in the case that's been raised was at what stage should the remedy in question have been available? In other words, this is going back to a very practical aspect of the cases before the European Court of Human Rights, that because there are a lot of them, the court takes rather a long time, or indeed a terribly long time, to give judgment in the most important Sometimes that is a period of five to seven or even 10 years. Sometimes it's even longer. And in the very fastest cases, it's nevertheless two or three years. Say you lodge your case three years ago and the court with great speed by its standards is coming around to think about whether or not you exhausted domestic remedies. And the government intervenes and says, two years ago, the Supreme Court changed its case law in relation to the matters about which you're complaining, and you had not tried a remedy which the Supreme Court's new interpretation of the law chose might be available. And the court has been caught by the fact of its heavy burden of case law into having to deal with the question, when did the law change and was it reasonable for the applicant to have tried that remedy? And what this really comes back to is quite apart from the practical difficulties of knowing, uh, of, of trying to speed up the court's case law, which we'd all love to be able to see happen, but I'm afraid the court is very overburdened. As I've said, one of the reasons why subsidiarity is so important and solving your problems before the national court is so important, but the practical difficulties of determining whether or not you should try an appeal which you think is doubtful or unlikely to succeed may be undone if you don't try the appeal and you nevertheless go to Strasbourg if somebody else takes a similar case and the case law moves on as it were behind your back. So that's really what's involved in the that case concerning Bulgaria and thank you again for the question. Um, this uh, passage from the uh, Swiss case I mentioned sets out the standard rule about the requirement to exhaust domestic remedies, and it tries to provide an additional reason, I'm not sure terribly persuasive, but nevertheless, an additional reason to justify why the national authorities are better placed than the Strasbourg court. And I, this is a, a principle which is um, 
often invoked by the court when it's feeling cautious. And it says the national courts are better placed, the national authorities are better placed than a European instance to determine matters in an area of controversy. But the real point I wanted to underline in relation to this judgment is uh, given in the, in the last, in the brackets at the foot of this paragraph. Uh, this is a case concerning Switzerland, and the court is relying on its previous case law in a case concerning France and a case concerning the Czech Republic. Uh, the GC in square brackets uh, indicates that these were grand chamber cases. So it has no hesitation at all in referring to uh, case law relating to other jurisdictions. So could we have the next slide but one, please? Uh, there, <clears throat> there are a couple of questions, actually, uh, Piers. Good. So maybe we'll take the questions, and if we Absolutely. endorse them, then you can finish the slides. Uh, in fact, this one has come out, regret to say, in the chat, and I'm breaking my rule of reading out a question from the chat. It comes from Vlatka Adler from Austria. If the court did not allow a regular revision, is it necessary to submit a request for an extraordinary revision in order to use the entire legal process at the national level? Well, this is a very good question again, and it shows the uh, high level of competence of um, uh, our participants today that these, if I may say so, rather advanced questions are being raised. The general rule is that national remedies of an ordinary nature must be exhausted and that extraordinary remedies uh, are not required. And the application to reopen a case, uh, although frequently available, um, is usually ignored by the European Court of Human Rights because uh, it doesn't raise anything new that uh, could have or was not determined at the first decision. And if it does raise something new, then unfortunately that means that the first proceedings were not pleaded effectively because somebody came up with a better idea and applied for reopening on that basis. Now, the exception to this rule, and I'm sorry that it's a, not super simple, the exception is where a reopening is permitted. Where a reopening is permitted by the National Court, but a remedy is nevertheless refused, that decision can be the final decision, and you can go on to Strasbourg. But applying to reopen in general is not required, and will not be taken into account any attempt to do so in calculating the four-month rule within which you must make your application to Strasbourg. So be cautious about reopening. If there are other questions you want me to yes. address, yes, I mean, the, the other question which came in, uh, uh, in fact, via email, uh, but uh, it's it, it's on a very it's, it's a substantive, not a procedural question. And if you and none of the speakers know the answers to it, don't worry, we'll move on. And it says in Bulgaria. We have contradictory case law in cases related to changing the names of persons with different sexual orientation in their identity documents. Can these persons defend themselves with direct reference to Article 8 of the Convention and with the case law of the Strasbourg Court in this matter? The answer is yes, they must, um, because the case law of uh, Strasbourg is quite clear that um, the change of name or, or your name is a matter of respect for your private life uh, under Article 8 of the Convention. And of course, without knowing the detail of the particular circumstances in Bulgaria, I can't go into great detail, but in principle, the issue that you mention is one which is covered within the scope of Article 8. And uh, of course, as we're all very aware, the issue of gender identity and gender identity change is a very hot potato at the moment, uh, and it's challenging the legal systems of probably all our jurisdictions. That, thank you so much, Piers, for your answer. We have a minute left, Piers, if you'd like to, uh, to, to wind up, and thank you very much for your answers to the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Well, First, can I just say that the final slide is uh, one uh, uh, relates, which I don't want to go to now, but you can go to in your own time, relates to a well-known dispute concerning the order for a cake made in Northern Ireland uh, 
by a gay activist who wanted to have icing put on it saying um, all the best for gay marriage. This arose in a, con a political context in uh, Northern Ireland uh, where gay marriage had at that time not been uh, permitted despite attempts to introduce the relevant legislation. And uh, it's an interesting case. It is, of course, a close parallel to a well-known U.S. Supreme Court case. And perhaps in your own time, you may be uh, inclined to have a quick look at it. What it shows is what I've been saying uh, throughout my intervention, which is the importance of making a convention argument based on the interpretation of the court's case law in the national jurisdiction. In that case, the applicant failed to do so, and uh, the application was rejected, although it appeared to raise uh, European Convention of Human Rights issues um, by the score. So it's an interesting illustration as to the court denying itself jurisdiction. And as I've tried to emphasize, your opportunities to get relief ought to be tried first in the national courts with every determination and all the determination that you would ultimately uh, submit to the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Piers. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, that was really excellent. We'll move on. So we keep to our time. Um, the next <clears throat> session is uh, called Enhancing the Principle of Subsidiarity. The European Court of Human Rights' knowledge sharing platform. And I'm very pleased to welcome Natalia Brady, uh, who's the coordinator of the knowledge sharing unit uh, in the Directorate of Juris Consult at the court itself. And Natalia is a senior lawyer at the Registry of the European Court of Human Rights and has been since 2001. She's drafted chamber and grand chamber judgments in respect of Russia on key convention topics like ill treatment in police custody, disappearance in Chechnya, uh, the state's positive obligations in disaster relief, uh, and so on. Um, and, um, in fact, and also, since this we've just been talking about it, in relation to discrimination uh, against LGBTI people. Uh, she joined uh, the Directorate of Juris Consult in 2000. 2021. First, there was a research lawyer, and since 2022, she's been coordinator of, of uh, knowledge sharing. So, Natalia, welcome, and we very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here, uh, to be able to present um, uh, all the way from Strasbourg, uh, the principle of subsidiarity, but above all, the knowledge sharing uh, platform which um, is a very recent development. Uh, the previous speakers have beautifully outlined what the principle of subsidiarity uh, means in terms of uh, practical implication for uh, lawyers, for your work. And uh, I'm here to talk uh, today uh, about uh, how Strasbourg Court is uh, helping you in uh, this endeavor. Member states to the Council of Europe are the first and foremost who are responsible for the effective implementation of the convention. To enable the subsidiarity principle to take effect, the courts develop practical tools to facilitate the day-to-day -day implementation of the convention at the national level. And among such tools are the knowledge sharing platforms. So why are the knowledge sharing platforms? What are they and um, how they came about? As um, we have already heard this morning, uh, <clears throat> it is difficult to know convention case law. Uh, it, and it's not only uh, the case um, uh, for, for the German lawyers that Stefan uh, uh, mentioned. It's, um, it also brings us uh, back to what Piers just um, said, that Strasbourg court follows its own case law. It's, um, it, it comes, um, uh, it, it takes, um, uh, it is taken for granted that Strasbourg Court does that, but how do we do that? 
with uh, such a vast uh, jurisprudence that uh, has been uh, generated uh, over the last, especially over the last recent years, with the complexity um, which uh, has been also growing exponentially, how can Strasbourg Court know its own case law? We have five sections, which um, which are compositions uh, of the court sitting separately, deliberating separately on different cases. So they need to follow each other case law. We have a grand chamber, which is supposed to be um, a, an umbrella for all uh, case law uh, of all, but there are only 17 uh, members of the composition and the, um, and the grand chamber. So judges need to know what is being adopted and, uh, and, uh, and follow that in real time. Uh, and we are no longer at, um, at the position um, uh, where we were 20 years ago when I just uh, arrived at the court as a, uh, uh, as, a, as a lawyer, where we had the luxury of being able to read every single judgment that has been adopted, to discuss it, to think about it, to, to project uh, on how it would apply to different circumstances. This is just no longer possible today um, for Strasbourg lawyers like myself. It's no longer possible for Strasbourg judges. So we uh, were faced with the same problem. We needed to know our, our case law and we had ha needed to have a quick and reliable entry point to all the topics to be able to, um, to know them in real time. Textbooks, of course, were something that um, would uh, be the most um, relevant presentation of the material, but each textbook, when, it's, when it is sent to print, is already way too old. The case law develops very fast these days. So we had to develop a tool um, that um, was uh, providing analytical material uh, <clears throat> that was focused on the most uh, important axis of, of, the, of the case law. So initially, knowledge sharing was um, developed for the court's internal use. The court needed a system in which the complex and voluminous case law available already in the HUDEC databases was analyzed and presented in a simple and categorized way. The uh, platform pages present materials um, article by article, and also by transversal themes, such as the environment, uh, terrorism, data protection, immigration, prisoners' rights, and so on. They provide detailed and uh, contextualized case law analysis on all the convention subjects, linked with real relevant uh, key materials, uh, commentaries, doctrine, and other publications, uh, such as um, key uh, texts and standards from our other international bodies. We call the uh, knowledge share sharing platform a one-stop um, dynamic uh, platform. One-stop is be because all the convention topics are covered in one place, and dynamic because it is not a static system, and that's its crucial feature. The uh, case law analytical content is updated every week, and importantly, it is managed so to uh, as to expand uh, to provide analysis on new case law issues as they emerge. In sum, the knowledge sharing platform provides a centralized and uh, comprehensive case law analysis updated on a weekly basis and involving in contacts as needs need be. Since its launch uh, internally, in 2018, uh, the knowledge sharing has indeed transformed our daily work. It gave uh, us access uh, to quick analytical materials and uh, became an indispensable tool by which uh, to ensure the coherence and the quality of the court's case law. It has quickly become evident uh, that uh, access to this platform would be just as useful as beneficial uh, for the work of the national courts, who, as uh, we uh, uh, remember from the subsidiarity principle, should be as well uh, equipped as the Strasbourg court in order to fulfill their conventional role. 
Consequently, um, a year are after um, the launch of the platform internally. In 2019, a version uh, of uh, the knowledge sharing platform was opened also to the member courts of the Superior Courts Network. This is the organization of the uh, Superior Courts uh, run by uh, the Strasbourg Court. Through the network, it gave access to the Superior Courts uh, to, to this um, same platform so that they could also test uh, its operation in the um, in uh, implementation of the convention dom domestically. And such was the uh, positive uh, feedback from uh, the use of this platform from the national courts that the Strasbourg court has decided that uh, other important actors, including the applicants, their representatives, legislators, government agents, um, and uh, other uh, national authorities should be also uh, able to usefully um, access the, the platform. Therefore, in collaboration with the Council of Europe, the court uh, decided to create a fully public um, platform accessible in both official languages, English and French. And uh, a year ago, in 2022, it was uh, indeed open to the general public and you can access it through the court's uh, internet site. Of course, the next uh, ambition is uh, even um, is uh, even more um, uh, fantastic, <laughs> but we hope uh, to be able to move in that direction. That is to make the platform available in um, other non-official languages um, of the um, of the Council of Europe member states beyond English and French version versions which uh, already exist. Uh, free access for judges and lawyers in national languages would um, genuinely transform the dissemination of, and um, knowledge about the court's uh, case law. And it would be a real game changer in terms of uh, subsidiarity because it would address the very uh, real uh, language um, barrier for the most uh, um, national courts and uh, national practitioners uh, to understanding and ultimately implementing the convention. The platform is uh, developed uh, by the Directorate of the Jurist Consult, where um, I uh, work. We are uh, collaborating with uh, case processing uh, lawyers who are specialized uh, in uh, different areas of the convention, who help us to create the um, analysis and, um, and to present the most uh, reliable um, analytical materials um, as, uh, as uh, the court develops its case law. I will now share the screen and will take you straight to the platform. You are now in the gateway, the gateway of the knowledge uh, sharing uh, platform, which um, most of you probably have uh, already seen before. We will um, uh, have a quick uh, overview of the platform's contents, the principles uh, by which it's organized. I'll tell you what kind of materials you can find it. And uh, then if we have time, we'll um, uh, have a few simulation searches to, to show how you can um, uh, find the necessary uh, materials. So first of all, uh, I mentioned that um, the language versions of the platform are English and French, and um, this button will in future take us um, to other languages. So now we choose the English for the sake of our presentation today. And um, here there is a, a, a tutorial uh, which you can... Um, two or three minutes uh, look at, but in principle, it should not actually be necessary to be able to use as a platform because it's all very intuitive and uh, very um, transparent and easy to use normally. So here the um, materials are organized article by article. There's limited number of conventions, so we um, normally are not required um, to uh, provide any more pages, but who knows, maybe there will be 
other articles, uh, uh, other protocols um, adopted for the convention. So maybe the, this space will um, will be added within the articles. Um, let's click on maybe Article Two, for example. You can find a case law guide, and you will see on what uh, date this um, guide is updated. We were telling you that um, I was telling you that uh, the um, um, platform is updated uh, weekly, but it doesn't mean that every single um, guide is, a, is updated every week. This is just simply not possible. Guides are updated twice a year, but to make sure that uh, all the materials uh, that will go in the guide are already available, we have the um, section called article updates, which um, lists all the cases which are due for the next update. So here you see the cases adopted and published in um, in November uh, this year. And here you can uh, uh, look at previous updates. So you can, um, when you're reading the um, case law guide, you uh, can uh, then supplement your knowledge uh, with, uh, with the cases and see whether anything on the topics you are researching have been adopted since the last update. The guides are, are PDF uh, documents. And uh, as in all PDF documents, you can do a search by pressing Control F. Uh, here you can, um, um, well, what, what can, what do we, see uh, an article two, well, we can uh, say death penalty, for example. So it will, um, uh, it will tell you uh, the results and then by clicking them, you can, um, you can get to, to the terms you are looking at. This is navigation within the document. I now go back. Apart from the uh, apart from the uh, guides, uh, under each article, or under many articles at least, you will find so-called key themes. Key themes are uh, materials um, which uh, look zoom in to a particular aspect under a particular article. For example, uh, under Article 2, which is Right to Life, we can have um, more detailed um, analysis uh, on the topics of domestic violence, medical negligence, and suicide. And, um, <clears throat> uh, and also there are some related um, key themes which are not specific uh, to this particular article, but can somehow be related. Um, the key themes are usually very short. We um, aim those documents to give a very uh, concise overview of this particular topic, referring you to the um, uh, to the key cases. It, it tends to be under 10 pages long, and it gives uh, at the end the list of all the um, of all the leading cases of all the um, um, landmark cases on the particular subjects from which you can start your research. We go back. We return home. We are back to the gateway. And um, after the articles, we can uh, see the materials organized by transversal themes. For example, uh, there is a topic immigration, which uh, we look at, and it's organized in the same way as the article, uh, as, as the article pages. So it has a guide, a guide on immigration. It will um, cover all articles, uh, all cases on on different articles of the convention, but which are related to this transversal theme on immigration. Uh, as the previous guide, it has been updated in February this year, so the updates are, are due. But in the meantime, the uh, cases which have been adopted since come under the transversal theme updates 
and uh, they come with small descriptions so you can see if there is anything relevant that happened uh, since. And as in the um, uh, article pages, we also have key themes, uh, which also give uh, the same um, zoom in look, uh, a quick um, uh, a quick glimpse onto what case law is the most relevant for uh, this particular uh, for this particular case. For, for example, for detention of mi migrant children, what are the leading cases? What are cases uh, related to Article 3, uh, protection from inhuman and degrading treatment? What are cases um, can, come in um, on the principles of detention under Article 5? Uh, what are relevant to the private and family life under Article 8? again, on the topic of detention of, of migrant children. We return to the uh, gateway because I wanted to show you uh, other uh, tools which exist on the, uh, on the, uh, on the main uh, page, on the gateway, but also, uh, but also on certain pages as well. So on the gateway, uh, we also have um, several um, very uh, useful tables. Uh, there is a table of all the grand chamber judgments and uh, decisions. This is an Excel table. It is very big, so it takes time to open. So this is uh, the table of all the Grand Chamber judgments and uh, decisions. Uh, it's organized chrono chronologically, but you can also filter through. Uh, for example, you want to choose um, judgments or decisions, or all of them, admissibility, partly inadmissible, a judgment only, or a just satisfaction judgment. You can... Um, uh, filter them by the article and um, and if you want to look for a particular uh, for a particular um, uh, term you can do as in Excel documents a free word search for example we type COVID as I can see that we have one And it takes us to the box where this term can be found. If there are several, let's see if there are several. That's all, only one. So this is the, um, the table. I won't open other tables because it takes uh, too long to open. But we have uh, the very useful tool as pending ground chamber cases. So what um, there you can check if there is a case which is not yet decided, but which raises a topic on which you are currently working. So you can watch uh, when it is adopted. Uh, there are pending in state cases and um, request for advisory opinion uh, uh, <clears throat> under prot protocol uh, number 16 of the convention. Uh, this also gives a very um, uh, useful um, insight into what is yet to come because advisory opinions are becoming um, increasingly very important. The states uh, that want to avoid um, having um, to lose a case in Strasbourg ask in a preliminary way uh, how one or the other questions could be resolved and the, um, and the Strasbourg court issues an advisory opinion by the Grand Chamber. Um, and these um, are summarized here. Unlike in Hudak, where only the um, delivered advisory opinions are presented, here you can also see the pending uh, opinions. 
we have some uh, compilations and uh, collection of cases. I won't be stopping there because you can just um, look at them yourself in your free time. They're basically um, collections of materials uh, which um, were selected for their importance and um, uh, and um, uh, and for for, for their uh, impact and to development of the uh, jurisprudence. Some useful materials uh, here include the travaux préparatoires of the um, of the convention and the protocols. Occasionally, they need to be consulted if um, interpretation um, of some um, of of a new subject is is um, is an um, is of such uh, uh, is of such uncertainty that it requires to go back to see what the convention drafters actually meant, whether this or the other interpretation could potentially be covered. Uh, the um, uh, case law information uh, case uh, notes. Uh, this is the materials which used to uh, be produced, but no, but no longer. But the archives can be consulted here. Selections of books and articles. Uh, these are the academic publications which are selected by the court's own library on the basis of what we have in the library. Sometimes we're asked, oh, why did you not put this article or that online publication? We uh, do not do that uh, for, for, for copyright reasons, but also because we have very limited uh, resource on to what we can research in the endless world of, uh, world of uh, academic publications. So these are limited selections um, made by our librarian and case law coordinators. Press fact sheets uh, are documents uh, produced by um, our press service, but we also thought it would be um, useful here. So they're the topics um, covered here and where relevant, they're also linked to the pages um, on particular articles and transversal themes. You will find the relevant fact sheets under the topics as well. And finally, we have uh, some links to the Council of Europe bodies and uh, there, um, and from there you can access the uh, soft law of the Council of Europe, various um, other conventions as well, the United Nations, the European Union, and um, of some other materials and um, international bodies you can be interested in. I see we have a couple of minutes, so I'll do um, a simulation of a search, unless Jonathan, no. you tell me there. No, yeah, well, there's a question, <clears throat> and I'd also like to make uh, an announcement, because uh, there are a number of people asking about how they can gain access to these presentations. Uh, so as was announced at the beginning, all the slides, I know that Natalia hasn't done slides, but the other speakers have, all the slides will be available on the European Lawyers Foundation website in a few days once they've been put up there, plus the video recording of this webinar. So you'll be able to look back and see whatever you want to do uh, through the video and with the slides. That's number one. Number two is certificates. Anybody who wants certificate of uh, continuing education, apply to your bar. We will send the bar the participants list. That's the way that it works. Natalia, yes, there is a question. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, first of all, um, praise for the uh, knowledge sharing platform itself. But the question is whether the current platform contains the translation of the case law guides into the different European languages, as was the case for the case law section before the knowledge sharing platform appeared. If not, is it still possible to find translations into the different languages on the so-called old version of the court's website? Excellent uh, point, uh, Jonathan. Thank you very much. I um, show you where to find it. When you uh, click on all case law guides, it takes us to the language um, um, versions here. You can find all the uh, guides um, um, available in um, in uh, all the languages where they used to exist. And um, Let's say guide on article two. Oh, sorry, that, that shouldn't be. Uh, let's say we want to see what we have in um, Bosnian, and you can find what articles, um, what what um, article guides 
we have in Bosnia. Uh, as to whether uh, they are accessible from the um, uh, from the court's uh, website, um, internet site, as they used to be, the idea was that we now centralize everything in the knowledge sharing platform, but the knowledge sharing platform itself is accessible through the court's internet website. So all the guides are accessible here. Thanks. Shall I? Yeah. Um, yes, do you have more questions? There is a question from Alina Gintimi, and I'd ask uh, uh, Alina to put the question in the question and answers. It's not for you. It's about admissibility st stage and the rules. Um, if you feel, if you're happy to answer that question, I'm happy to put it to you. Uh, but you're here more for the knowledge sharing platform, so I don't. I know. can try. <laughs> okay. Okay. And it refined. So um, it's in the chat whereas it should be in the question and answers i know that currently in the admissibility stage uh, the court checks very carefully how rule 47 is respected by the applicant can you tell us exactly how rule 47 is applied for individual application uh, by the european court of human rights well i, I think that um was already uh, pretty much covered by um uh, by the previous speakers and quite um, a lot of details uh, that um, uh, um, uh, and it, and it's uh, and it's quite um, uh, quite well presented on the um, uh, on the um, page for applicants as well. There is a step by step guide that you need to follow and failure to to um, uh, comply with uh, with, uh, with uh, those regulations is uh, can result in the admissib inadmissibility decision. Um, uh, which would be um, a refusal at even administrative level to treat the application to register it, uh, the absence of a signature or the um, a failure to uh, put uh, facts and uh, and legal arguments in the relevant sections can uh, be examples of that. Thank you for answering that, Natalia. Natalia, we've come to the end of the time. We must move on. I see Achilleus there. Thank you very, very much for your very excellent presentation, which I know was appreciated by everybody. Uh, we move thank on you for the to, attention. We move on to our next and last speaker, whom we really must thank because he went to Strasbourg um, and unfortunately he caught uh, COVID whilst he was there. So we thank him very much indeed uh, for, for being with us today. He tells us he won't be able to sing, uh, but he hopes he'll be able to speak to you all. Uh, that's Achilleus Dimitriades, who'll be talking about enhancing the principle of subsidiarity, endorsement of ECHR arguments uh, by senior national courts. Uh, Achilleus is a Cypriot lawyer with over 30 years experience in representing clients before the European Court of Human Rights. He litigates human rights cases both before the Cyprus courts uh, as well as the ECHR, uh, European Court of Human Rights and the UN Human Rights Council. And he's in, currently involved in a number of cases before the European Court of Human Rights and uh, and has since 1989 successfully conducted the first case before the Strasbourg Court against Cyprus and the first against Turkey and has done cases in a wide variety uh, of areas of law and bet uh, for between 2015 and 2021 he served as the chair of the Human Rights Committee of the Cyprus Bar Association. Achilles, over to you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Jonathan. Um... I, I hope I don't lose my voice. I'll try my best. Uh, but thank you very much for bringing me over on, on this presentation. Um, it, was, it, it has been very interesting listening to uh, Stefan and Pierce analyzing a, a lot of the things I was hoping to analyze uh, with you uh, today. So in that respect, uh, they've done more of my job than, than I will. But I will try if we can take the next uh, sl slide, please. Right. Um, I will try and make my analysis on three levels. I'd like to talk about the phase before the National Court, the phase before the European Court of Human Rights, and then the third phase, which is execution. Why do I need to talk about the court? Um, as uh, uh, both Pierce and Stefan has explained, uh, the, subsidi the subsidiarity principle deals with the exhaustion of domestic remedies, essentially. 
So if you do not exhaust domestic remedies, uh, you can't really get into Strasbourg. It is of fundamental importance. And if there is one piece of advice I can share with you is bring in human rights as early as possible, even at first instance. Uh, deal with the Strasbourg case law at the very beginning. And depending on what uh, your system is and how the convention is incorporated, be that on the level of national law, be that higher than national law, or be that as part or equal to your constitution, irrespective of the level at which the convention is in your legal system, do try and bring it in as early as possible. The second level is the European Court of Human Rights, the court. Um, there is a need to explain to the court why you are making this application. Of course, there's 13 pages of the application, but there's also something more. There's also the notion of priority and the whole idea is to try and get priority so that your case in fact is dealt with quickly. And the last, which of course is the most important element in this exercise, is execution. So you find the violation. Um, what next? Is there any remedy for the applicant? And judgments usually have three levels. They have the just satisfaction, they have the individual measures, and they have the general measures. I want to talk about just, just satisfaction only because that's the part of execution that I think is interesting and important in this exercise. May I have this next slide, please? Thank you. Let's talk about the national court level. The most important thing which will help you in satisfying the requirement of exhausting domestic remedies is to clearly identify the issue, spell it out, have a specific paragraph or paragraphs. If you're doing a ground of appeal, make a ground of appeal which is specific to the, uh, to the articles of the convention that you are invoking. Make a point of focusing in the national court of the references to the European Convention of Human Rights. Because at the end of the day, you really need to put to your national court all the arguments that Strasbourg has already generated and give your national judge a chance to look at these points and possibly take a decision that will be in your favor in terms of finding a violation of the convention. And that will avoid going all the way to Strasbourg. The objective is not to go to Strasbourg. The objective is to establish a violation as quickly as possible. And simple things like make sure you put your arguments in writing, in the grounds of appeal, in your pleadings. Do not just rely on the oral hearing, if there is one, where you make these points. And of course, the general point that CCB is trying to put across is the need for endorsement. We need to have the national courts dealing with this issue so that there is a clear submission and people understand where you're coming from and why you think, <coughs> excuse me, and why you believe there is a violation. If you manage to get your national court to endorse this proceeding, to point out the problem and to understand what is the issue, you may have to avoid perhaps going to Strasbourg, or at least you will be able to have a judgment that sets out all these points that you wanted to deal with in the first place. And sharing the knowledge of the court and understanding the case law would actually make the judge's life more interesting and the judge's life easier in understanding the issues and giving a judgment that will establish a violation so that the applicant is successful. So put as much effort as you can in trying to get an endorsement from the local courts the local national courts to understand, oh. 
excuse me, to understand the problem and to have a priority established at the next stage. Because your job does not finish merely by pointing out the potential violation through the exhaustion procedure. You also have another job, which is to put your case in a way that will ensure that you have a priority in the procedure before Strasbourg. So if I could have the next slide, please. So you've identified the issue in the national phase. Well, you really need to communicate that to the court. Excuse me. How can you communicate that? Well, obviously from the pleadings and from the endorsement and from the information you'll be able to generate in the domestic uh, proceedings. But you can also have another way of doing it. And it's a very uh, not often used part of the um, application form. Please make a note of this. Paragraph 71 of the application form on page 13 is a crucial part, which of course only has five lines to deal with. But if you can actually make your point of why your case is important, this will ensure a priority in dealing with it by the European Court. And what is this priority? Um, if I may break it into two, I would like to look at it from the point of view of the national court, and I would like to look at it from the point of view of the European court. Let's take the first one, the national court. Why is this case important for your national uh, domestic legal order? Why does this case merit uh, attention by the European court? Well, it merits attention because it's a huge issue in your domestic system. It affects a lot of people. It is of fundamental importance and people need to deal with it very quickly. So it is important that this case is dealt with. And you never know, it may even become a pilot case. So that's only half of the problem. The other half of the problem is assuming this case is important for the national legal order, why does the European court have to consider it important for Strasbourg as well? Because it doesn't mean that just because it's important in your domestic courts, it is also important for Strasbourg. Strasbourg has seven criteria, uh, seven criteria categories, which have to be filled in. And perhaps we can later take uh, some questions on this. The first one has to do with general measures, sorry, with um, measures under rule, 29, uh, rule 39, which have to do with urgent applications. There is, there is a risk of life or health or in a family matter, children are involved. The second has to deal with cases that have an impact and could end up as being pilot case judgments. The third one deals with specific articles, Article 2, right of life, Article 3, freedom from torture, Article 4, freedom from slavery, and Article 5, uh, liberty and security of the person. If it is in those four articles, then you have a priority. Fourth priority, which is most cases, is potentially well-founded application, applications based on other articles. The fifth one is repetitive cases. The sixth one is problems of admissibility. And the seventh cases where are manifestly inadmissible. So if you can somehow in five lines try to introduce the concept of priority, you will have served your case very well because you will have managed to communicate to Strasbourg, not only that you have exhausted domestic remedy, but that you have also given the priority that your case merits because of its importance at the domestic level, as well as the importance Strasbourg should have in their own uh, priority list. Could I please have the next slide? 
So let us then assume you've managed to exhaust domestic remedies, you've managed to get the court to understand that you have priority and you will go through the system. Um, hopefully you will get your judgment. Hopefully there will be a violation and the violation will then have to be executed. Sorry, the, the violate the judgment that creates the violation will then have to be executed. I will repeat that a judgment has three levels. First is just satisfaction. Second is individual measures. And third is general measures. Let me start by the last one. General measures is what you have to do for everybody in the category of which the individual has been identified. And individual measures is what you have to do so that the person who is the applicant is put in the position he should have been had there not been a violation. I do not want to deal with these two because these are really domestic issues for the particular country. And a judgment is binding on that country under Article 46. I want to talk a little bit, uh, if I have time, Jonathan, uh, about the possibility of enforcing a judgment. I want, to think, I want you to think a little bit about the domesticating of the execution. Let us assume that you've had your judgment and the just satisfaction there is there, and the country refuses to pay or is delayed in paying. What do you do? Well, fine, you go to the Committee of Ministers, you file your um, comments every four months that the Committee of Ministers has a meeting. These are circulated uh, under the rules, and then you hope that other law-abiding countries will push the country against which you have a judgment so that it actually ex executes that judgment. There is no way of really enforcing that mechanism, uh, that judgment, unless we devise a new mechanism. I will repeat that under Article 46, a judgment is binding against the state against which it has been issued. Well, if it's binding against that state, what is its status against the other states? Could we run an argument under Article uh, 1, where parties undertake that they will secure the rights guaranteed in the convention to anyone within their jurisdiction? Can we analyze the judgment as some sort of relationship between the applicant and the respondent? And that relationship is then brought into the domestic legal order of another country so that you can execute it. I know it's very uh, difficult to go down this road, but I can assure you there are cases where judgments, at least the monetary part of them, are not executed. So what is the applicant going to do about it? And I'm afraid the only answer I've been able to find so far is to try and make this international award, this judgment of Strasbourg, as part of the domestic legal order, first of the country against which it has been issued, which clearly has a binding nature because of Article 46, but then perhaps go on a leap and consider the possibility that this judgment could also be binding against the respondent in a third country. And if this analysis were to apply, then we will have universal enforceability of judgments in other member states, which I think should be the future in order to ensure the binding nature of a judgment. Um, I don't know. Can I ask? Yes, no, no. 
Perfect, perfect. Um, so there are a couple of questions. Um, but before we come to the questions, I want to make my announcement again, because there are repeated comments in the chat. Because all the speakers have been so excellent with such excellent presentations, uh, people want it sent to them by email. We will not be sending the materials by email. They will be put on the website of the European Lawyers Foundation for free download. The presentations and the web and the webinar, the video recording of the webinar. So you will be able to get hold of both the video and the uh, presentations from the website and download them for free. Uh, on to a question. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights often dismisses valid cases without real explanation, with a standard answer to all, like not acceptable, without explaining why it's not acceptable, which is not fair and definitely doesn't show fair trial. And we've no way of overturning this and reacting to it. Why and how? Uh, I don't know if you're able to give us some guidance on that, Achilles. Yes, well, I, I, I'll, I'll share the, the person who had, uh, who had asked the question. I'll share um, his or hers anxiety about the fact that when, judge, when uh, applications are dismissed, you only get a paragraph about it saying that it doesn't cover the convention or it's, there's no exhaustion of domestic remedies. Um, I, I, would, I will advise on a procedural and on a substantive level. On a procedural level, um, at least my experience has been to tell clients from the beginning that we are doing this, but if we go down, there will be a very short explanation. So do not expect a very detailed procedure or a very detailed judgment if we are thrown out at admissibility level. Once, of course, you pass admissibility, then you will have a detailed explanation as to whether there was or there wasn't a violation. Now, from the point of view of the court, the reason this procedure is happening, I would assume, is because there is not enough time to sit down and draft a detailed um, judgment on it. So a detailed decision on it. So I guess it's a question of expediency or speed, but it is certainly a huge drawback, which actually affects people individually and become emotional about it because they believe that they are right. They believe that their human rights have been violated. And yet, even if they go to Strasbourg, they just get one simple paragraph saying you just didn't get it right and it's not good enough well i'm afraid it's not good enough and it's <laughs> not uh, it's not something that uh, we can change and uh, as i said before the only practical um, advice i can suggest is that people should alert applicants as to this possibility along with uh, the fact that not every case that goes to strasbourg ends up with a judgment in favor of the applicant uh, there is a question about teaching human rights. And again, you know, if you're able to answer it, uh, this question is wondering whether there's been an analysis about how human rights law is taught at domestic level. Uh, if human rights law is taught separately from national law, uh, and would it be better then if the uh, ECHR standard is included in the courses of national law? Yes, well, very interesting question. How, how do we get human rights integrated into the system from the beginning? Very good point. Um, perhaps uh, human rights is an area which has um, part, which includes part of every other part of the law, because no matter what the law says, you must have due process, you must have fair trial. So all these elements should be included um, in every individual section of the law that you're dealing with. Um, I'm not sure how um, this can be done. I'm, I'm not sure because I didn't take human rights at university, so I really can't tell you more about it. But I, I take the point, I take the point uh, because of its universal application and the way it affects every single section of the law. Uh, that there must be a reconsideration of the methodology followed when people are taught human rights. Perhaps one or two sessions should be taken in giving an interface 
between other parts of the law and human rights. Uh, and I think that's a very valid question. Last question, just a minute, be very brief, please, if you would, because we're right at the end. Natalia Mishina says, are there already any ideas how to make judgments obligatory for third countries, countries that weren't engaged? Well, I, this is exactly what I was trying to say under Article 46. I'll give you some bad news, actually. Last week, there was a case where um, a judgment against a certain country had not been executed. Uh, and the applicant in that case went into his own domestic legal order, obtained a Garnishi order against the European Commission, which had been um, giving money to this country that refused to pay the judgment debt. <laughs> and then Luxembourg the other day said that this judgment from Strasbourg was a private right and would not accept in waiving the commission's immunity in order to execute the judgment. But I, I will congratulate the person who has asked the question because I think that is the future. The future is how we are going to make judgments of the court, at least on the monetary level, universally applicable in every member state so that at the end of the day, under Article 1 of the Convention, the parties will have to secure the rights generated from a judgment in their own jurisdiction. Thank you, thank you, Achilles. We're exactly on time, so we'll take it no further. I'm very grateful. I, On behalf of the participants, I applaud all the speakers, and there have been very lovely comments in the chat about how much they've appreciated the speakers' presentations. I repeat, the presentations and the video will be on the European Lawyers Foundation's website. We will not be able to send them out by email. I also repeat, you need certificates. Please apply to your bar, and then they will apply to us, and we will send the participants list. I thank once again uh, all the speakers for their very excellent and interesting presentations. I thank you, the participants, for your very interesting questions, as you have seen. And I say goodbye, and I hope you'll participate in future in, in our webinars. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye.